morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's great to be here with you this morning. Let me, let me start by just uh, reading a quick passage out of Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 20 through, 22 through 29 say, The stone the builders have rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. This morning, as we begin our service time, during the, the last month or so, last few weeks, we have been hearing reports from ministry leaders around our congregation. And you've heard, last week, you heard a finance team report, and you've heard from the youth. You'll hear coming up from missions, and, and I'll give a little report as a part of a sermon at some point. And so you've, you've heard reports. Today, you're going to hear a report from Terry Beatles. Terry is, I think, among the leaders in our congregation, he's the only person that's going to give a report who's not a board member. Terry is, is a volunteer in our congregation who has taken on the responsibility for our buildings and grounds. And so he's going to come and share some of the projects that, that he has accomplished with his team over this past year. And so Terry, I'll invite you to come. And as he comes, let's, uh, let's pray and welcome the presence of the Lord as we, as we uh, hear about some family business. Hey, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and be in your presence. This is the day that you have made and we will rejoice in it. We recognize today, Lord, that as a body, we have, we have lots going on. We have volunteers working in tons of different areas, people who are reaching out with, with help for families who need help with food. We have people who are in ministry to all ages. We, we have people working in the community in all kinds of different areas of ministry, and we have, we have missionaries working around the globe. We thank you, God, for, for people who are serving you in all kinds of different capacities and making your kingdom great, Lord. Thank you for, for this time that we can come and worship you together. And as we continue in this season of, of talking through some of our family business, we pray that you would open our ears and give our hearts attention to what Terry has to tell us and that we would rejoice because good things have happened in the life of our congregation over this past year. And so, Lord, we pray your blessing on Terry and his ministry to us, and we thank you for, for his service. We thank you again, God, for your presence that's here with us. May we rejoice in this day that you have made. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. And uh, th this, I'm always amazed at this time of year that we have accomplished all this stuff because of your generosity and the Lord's been blessing us. And some of the things we do are trying to prepare a building for the future. You know, that's the ongoing challenge. But with that, we'll get started with some slides. Uh, the new roof was on the north end of the building. There was a canopy there before, and we covered the canopy, and that's to help protect it and give us some additional life out of that. And, and so that. And then the teens pulled the carpet up in the game room at the, at the Edge Center, and they all worked hard, and I think they enjoyed it. <laughs> there. And then we put down new flooring. There's on the left, you'll see the concrete was placed below the round room, and that was for their, our food pantry ministry to have more room for their, uh, their efforts. And then on the right side there, we put down new baseboard in, in the teen hallway after the new flooring was put down in the Edge Center. Uh, the, there's the new flooring in the Edge Center at the game room. It's it all installed. And then on the right side, we redid a kitchen to give them additional storage and took out the plumbing fixtures and what have you. The, and that's in the stage area of the edge. There is uh, the flooring going down in the, on the left, the flooring going down in the edge hallway. And then on the right, David and, uh, and I had to cut off all the doors because the flooring was taller than th that would allow the doors to close. So we cut all those down. 
We had a work day at our friend Larry Stuck on the left side. There were several volunteers from our church showed up there to clean up his yard. And then on the right side, we had a, a Saturday uh, work day here at the church. We cleaned up the property and took out the bushes and trimmed the bushes. Uh, on the left, we built a new retaining wall behind Parsonage 2. The, remember the old railroad? There's a the railroad ties on the right side. And on the left side is the new wall. And it was much improved. As you can see, that it looked like the wall was about ready to fall down. So it was time. And then we got the snowstorms, and we had Dwayne Pursoon and Todd Johnson on their four-wheelers moving snow, and also we got uh, Doug Bell with his uh, little uh, bobcat, and he scooped some snow for it to us. And there was a volunteer from the Cornerstone uh, that moved some snow also. And then on the left, we put up new, new blinds in the church offices, and the old ones were starting to deteriorate. And our friend Mark helped us with that and Doug Beggs. On the right side, some of the Cornerstone kids helped us as we were preparing some, one of the mud holes so that they wouldn't have to tromp through. And there's Ray and Mark working on the same area that the Cornerstone kids were working on at, at, on the playground. We redid our four-year ent sanctuary entrance. We took out the rock wall, and uh, th then we put in new uh, new sheetrock and new doors. And we're going to come. There's the finished product of the after it was completed. I was that come out very beautiful. I'm very pleased with that. And. Uh, all our volunteers make this happen, and we appreciate everyone who helps us. Uh, I'll tell you some additional things that we don't have pictures for. We, re we installed a new carpet in the basement at Parsonage 2 uh, to make it a little more comfortable for that family. And new blinds were installed at Parsonage 2. Uh, carpet was installed in our church nursery so the little kids wouldn't uh, injure themselves when they, f when they fall. And then this uh, new bifold door is now completely folded up. Was the the old door was replaced and a new door put in to uh, because the, the old door is about ready to fall apart. But I appreciate everybody's support and all the many volunteers. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kathy Young, and this is my son, Garrett. Um, crisis care kits for Ukrainian refugees are due today. If you forgot your bags, please bring them to the office first thing in the morning on Monday. Um, tomorrow, to, tonight, together we pray, prayer gathering this evening. It's from 6.30 to 8 at Echo Hills Church a community-wide prayer event led by pastors from churches in the valley, including our own Pastor Paul. And then we got Easter services. So first up, we have the Holy Week prayer walk, which is offered on two different days, so you can choose which one works better for you. Uh, one of them is Monday, April 11th, and Wednesday, April 13th, and both of them are from 6 to 7.30. Pastor Becca will speak more about this later in the service. Uh, next, we have the Good Friday service, which is April 15th at 6 p.m., and then Easter Sunday, which is April 17th, brunch and children's extravaganza at 9 a.m., worship service at 10.30 a.m. Consider inviting friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors. And remember our digital bulletin at the website there. Um, there's two ways to give with your tithe tithes and offerings. One is the online at First NAS website, and the second is in person. There's a box in the back every Sunday. Thank you for your continued faithfulness. We really appreciate it. We'll start, we're going to start into worship, and if you would like to stand or however you feel like you worship best, you are welcome to do that. And Joel is going to be leading from the drum set, and we hope you uh, enjoy and will worship with us. One, two, three, four. Ooh, I have 
five days I lose the fight Try my best but just don't get it right Where I talk, talk that I don't walk Miss the moments right before my eyes Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have helped Well, I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be a little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace A little more like Jesus a little less like me Yeah, there's no denying I have changed I've been saved from who I used to be But even at my best, I must confess I still need help to see the way you see Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have held When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be a little more like mercy A little more like grace a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith. A little more like patience, a little more like peace. A little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Oh, to feed the beggar on the street, love to be your hands and feet. Freely give what I receive, Lord, help me be. I want to put you first above all else Love my neighbor as myself In the moments no one sees Lord, help me be One, two, a little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith A little more like patience a little more like peace A little more like Jesus A little less like me A little more I'm living Everything I preach A little more like Jesus A little less like me Oh, a little less like me
pulled me from the ashes you have broken every curse blessed redeemer you have set this captive free lord i can't help but sing Thank you. 
to our prayer song, um, we're going to read a little Psalm 63, um, and this is what Pastor Rebecca will be preaching on, and um, Peter, you can go ahead and just start and kind of lead us into, we're going to do an older song that hopefully some of you know, um, it's been a while, but um, Psalm 63 is, oh God, you are my God, and I earnestly search for you, my soul thirsts for you, my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in your sanctuary and, and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I'll praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadows of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hands hold me securely. It is, it's, it is awesome. Oh God, you are my God. And I... Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in which we get to gather to worship you. We praise you and thank you for all your blessings. Help us to remember that you are in control. Lord, be with those in Ukraine as well as those who have left the country. Give them a peace that exceeds their understanding and give them comfort only you can give. Be with all those who are sick and need healing. Bless them and heal their bodies. Thank you, Lord for all that you do in our lives. Help us to remember how holy you are. Open our hearts and minds to hear from you today, Lord. Help us to continue to become more like you every day and help us to continue to grow. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Amen. Good morning. 
Um, as uh, Kathy and Garrett Young mentioned, um, I want to share a little bit about Holy Week Prayer Walk real quick. Um, we are going to have a prayer walk on Monday the 11th of April and Wednesday the 13th of April. It's the same thing both days. Um, we wanted to open it up so more people could come and join in. Um, but this is going to be a self-guided um, walk through scripture during the Holy Week events. So Holy Week is Palm Sunday, um, and we're going to go up until the cross that day. Um, and there's going to be several stations throughout the church, and at each station it'll be interactive. So if you went to the Ash Wednesday service, um, it's going to be kind of similar to that, um, where you're going to be able to engage hands-on with scripture at each station. Um, it's self-guided, so no one's going to be telling you when to move stations. You're able to just go ahead and engage with each station as long as you need. Um, and so the time is 6 to 7.30. Is that me? We'll see if it stays with my hair. Okay. Um, we, uh, it's going to be any time drop in between 6 and 7.30. And so what that means is you can come. You don't have to come right at 6. It's probably going to take about 30 minutes or so to get through all of it. So if you are working until 6.30, come on after. It's going to be a great time and just a time where we're able to focus on, um, on the cross and on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Okay, we're going to switch gears and hopefully, hopefully this stays. Um, have you guys been enjoying the warmer weather? Yes. Have you guys been able to get outside? A little bit. Um, this is part of my favorite time of the year because daylight savings has begun and that means that we are able to enjoy the um, lighter um, nights longer, and so we're able to actually get outside after work, or you're able to get outside after dinner, and the way that my family has been getting outside a lot is by going on walks. So we've been putting um, our kids in the double stroller, and away we go, and we have been going in walks in the neighborhood, um, but there's also a park that we have learned to really enjoy with our family, and that is because we have learned that our two-year-old, Sasha, is a bird watcher at heart. Um, I have never really paid attention to birds. I always thought that was kind of like an interesting hobby to just kind of sit there for hours and hours and, and watch the birds. But Sasha has opened my eyes. Um, she gets so excited and to see the pure joy in her face and she starts jumping up and down when she sees a bird flying by or if she spots one in a tree or if she sees or if she hears them and she'll stop and she'll look at me and she'll freeze and she'll go, do you hear that? Do you hear that, mama? Mama, what is that? What is that? And she knows what it is. She is very aware that it is a bird, but she wants to share, she wants me to share in the joy with her when she experiences seeing these birds. And so on this path that we've been going, the further along the path you go, the more and more you can see, the more um, you are able to hear the birds talking to each other. And you know, little kids teach you a lot. Because Sasha has taught me to just rest in a moment and just take that time to see what is going on around me. I am embarrassed to say that when we started our walk several weeks ago, I didn't even know that birds were around. I knew that they were there, I guess. I could have seen them. I would have heard them if I took some time to pay attention, um, but I didn't. I didn't take time to pay attention because I have 80,000 things going on in my head at once. And um, so Sasha has, has really taught me to just sit in the Lord's presence, to experience nature, and to rest and to live in that stillness um, and in that peace. When we're go, go, go all the time, you can be like me where you get distracted and you're not able to hear or see what's right in front of us. It's easier to find times to rest like that when things are going well, when we are in seasons of contentment and we're seasons of happiness. Um, it's a lot harder when we are feeling like the weight of the world's on our shoulders and we have fear in our hearts or we are worrying or um, we feel downcast. This morning, we're going to walk through a passage of scripture in the book of Isaiah um, 43. So I'm actually not preaching on um, Psalm 63, although the cool thing about the Bible is that um, it, it works today, too. Um, the exact thing that um, Julie read for us this morning um, 
David is in the wilderness, and that's when he wrote those words, is he's in the wilderness saying, God, where are you? But I'm going to cling on to you no matter what, and that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, originally, Isaiah 43, which is where we're at today, um, was written to a people who were experiencing a lengthy season of suffering. Um, they experienced loss. They were in a place where everything that they had ever known was turned upside down. Um, their normalcy was completely ruined. Um, they were defeated. They were worn down. And yet, in the midst of this time, God gave a message of hope. Um, so we are going to be in um, Isaiah 43, 16 through 21. So if you want to turn there, um, just go ahead and bookmark that. It's going to take us a little bit of time to get there. Um, but I know that some of you came in today um, feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders, feeling the weight of sickness, feeling the weight of war that we're reading about and hearing about in different parts of our world, um, maybe the weight of loss. And so this message of hope that God gave to the people of Israel is a message of hope for us this morning as well. Um, Isaiah, where we're at, is in the Old Testament, and he is a prophet, and he is one of our major prophets of what we call them. So he's not a major prophet because we say that he's more anointed from the Lord. We're not saying that he's a major prophet because he, he spoke better or he had better things to share with the people. Um, he's a major prophet versus a minor prophet because the sheer length of the book is 66 chapters long. And over this book, um, a lot is going on and a lot has happened. And there seems to be two very clear sections in this book. Um, the first is chapters 1 through 39. And then there's kind of a time gap there in the middle between 39 and 40. And then when 40 starts, the message and um, the, the context and the, the things that are going on in history seem very different. And so we are in 43 today, so we kind of need to know what's going on um, in order to get there. Because if we just jump in, you can't really just jump into the book of Isaiah. Um, so we kind of need to know the history of Israel and then what is going on to get us to this point. If you remember in history, um, Abraham was told by God that he was going to be the father of many nations and that all nations would be blessed through him. Um, and that's what happened. Um, he, they ended up being known as the people of Israel, which were representing the 12 sons or the 12 tribes of Jacob. And he ended up changing his name to Israel, or God changed his name to Israel when he wrestled with God. And so they were known as, as the people of Israel. Um, they found favor in Egypt um, for many years, but then after time had changed and time had progressed, um, they ended up becoming enslaved in Israel. And you guys know this story. For over 400 years, they were in a period of being horribly oppressed. They were having demands of labor, and um, they weren't able to um, really do anything that they wanted. They were stuck in this oppression, in this, um, in this captivity. In the midst of the suffering, God develop, or delivers these people in a miraculous way. Um, he sends plagues. I'm sure you guys know all these. The Passover that we'll be um, talking about here in a couple of weeks. Um, and then it all culminated in the parting of the Red Sea. And the parting of the Red Sea is when God shows his power and he, he parts the Red Sea and his people walk through on dry land, which is completely impossible for anybody else but not for God. And they get through and... Um, the threat of the Israelite or of the Egyptians is no longer there. The rest of the time, the people kind of had ups and downs. They had periods of wandering in the wilderness. They had periods of the kings and the or the judges and the kings, and they would have times of being completely rebellious towards the Lord. And then there were times that they were going full steam ahead and they were um, worshiping God. It was in these moments, though, that God is there no matter what. God is there at our highest of highs and our lowest of lows. Um, after some time, the people of Israel split into two, and there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom at this time that, that Isaiah is on the scene has been wiped out. They were overtaken, and um, they're, they're kind of gone. So now you have the southern kingdom of Judah, and that is who they are talking to today. That's who Isaiah is, is talking with and sharing messages from the Lord. And so they have experienced um, watching the whole history and knowing the history, knowing that God has shown up to their ancestors. They know that they are the promised people. Um, but they are, in the first 39 chapters, they are um, 
have the threat of the Babylonian Empire on the horizon. They know that they just watched the, the northern kingdom get taken out by the Assyrians, and now the Babylonian Empire, who is even more powerful and more mightier, is coming, and they are they're knocking at the door of the southern kingdom. Um, so that's where we find ourselves. Um, the time gap that happens between chapters 39 and 40 is... Um, when they face destruction. And the Babylonian Empire, what had been foretold in those first 39 chapters, has now happened, and they are now living in the period of exile. So God didn't deliver them the way that they had heard the stories about the, their ancestors in Egypt. They're now stuck in Babylon. They have been forcefully moved out of their land. They have been carted off. And so here we are, and... It happened in three different sections. Um, They deported these people three different times. Um, And so there was a lot of people who were stuck in Babylon at this time. And they're looking around and they're stuck there. Their city is in ruins. Their temple where God dwells is completely um, flattened, I guess you could say. Um, It's completely devastated. And the Babylonians are now have tried to assimilate them into their culture. The Babylonians, the way that they did this was not like the Egyptians where they put them in slavery and were uh, oppressing them. Instead, the Babylonians said, we're going to afford you all the opportunities to be part of our economy, to be part of our culture. Um, We want you to be part of our religious expression. Um, And in doing so, over time, you might become a little less Jewish and a little more Babylonian because that's really what they wanted. They kind of wanted to eliminate... um, eliminate their culture. Um, it didn't really work, though, because as, as they're looking on one hand, they're seeing the gods and the, the false gods of the Babylonians. Um, they're also hearing the message of Isaiah throughout this time in exile, and they're knowing that they're hearing that God is here, that there's a message of hope, but at the same time, they're not seeing it. So they might be kind of wavering and thinking, well, maybe I should go check out those gods over there because maybe they're going to help me out because God's done nothing. Where is God in this time? So it brings us up to speed. Um, The people of Israel are talking to God and bringing up grievances at this point and saying, where are you? We look around, we see that our temple is gone, we're not in our land anymore, and why didn't you show up? Why didn't you save us? Why didn't you deliver us? Why are we stuck in this, in this place when you, you could help us the way that you helped our ancestors? And so the way that God decides to speak to them and to give them a message is through the prophet Isaiah in a vision. And in a vision of like, kind of like a trial setting. So imagine if you're on trial, you have a courtroom, you have um, defendants, and you have witnesses, and you have testimonies. And that's the kind of imagery that God is, is giving to Isaiah and saying, okay, you're telling me that I haven't shown up. You're telling me that where are you? Let's go ahead and figure out where the other gods have been. So let's put the other gods on trial. And so in this courtroom setting, he says, let's call witnesses from the different nations surrounding us, and let's ask them where their gods have been during this time. And so he asks, he says, is there anybody who can witness to these gods doing anything? Is there anybody who can say that there has been power and might coming out of these gods, maybe yesterday, maybe sometime in the present? Or is there any thought that there's going to be a future that these gods are going to show up and show their might the way that I have. And silence happened. Nobody came forward because these gods are made by human hands. These gods are not almighty. These gods are not powerful. And so he tries to tell his people, you do have a choice. You can, you can go after these gods that you think are going to help you, but they're, they're nothing. They can't do anything for you. Or you can keep following me, and you can keep following my message, and that message is, I am here with you even in the midst of your suffering. Um, so in contrast, um, God says, now put me on trial. You're sitting over here saying that you want to know where I'm at. Let's figure out where I've been. Let's put me on trial. And will you be my witnesses, and will you speak to the evidence of where I have been? And so this is the words that um, Isaiah um, shares from God um, kind of in this trial setting. This is um, Isaiah 43, verses 16 and 17. 
I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. So we got here to God saying this to his people through the prophet Isaiah because God had heard the complaints over and over. But he knew they were stuck in exile. They knew they were in the wilderness figuratively. So after God just spent all kinds of time saying, these false gods can't do anything for you. You don't want to try to go and start worshiping something else that is literally a a figment of your imagination. He says, this is the concrete evidence of where I've been. He says, I opened a way through the waters. That was me. I dried up the seabed so that your ancestors could walk through safely to freedom from slavery. I defeated your enemies of your ancestors and wiped them out. I am the Lord. Nobody else can say that. There's no match for me. No one's in the same ballpark as me. These idols can't even have a leg to stand on. So here God is proclaiming his rightful victory, and he's taking credit for the miraculous things he has done. He no doubt shows that he has authority over creation. In fact, he made creation. But he can, he can um, have authority over controlling the massive seawaters. He shows he has authority over um, even the most feared and most militant armies with their chariots and their horses because by single-handedly, or he single-handedly caused their demise when he's talking about Egypt. This is rather ironic to me, though. Think about it. These people are sitting here saying, God, where have you been? And he goes, well, I worked many, many, many years ago. And they're like, where are you right now? Just because you worked a long time ago, I'm not seeing the evidence of where you're at. He's addressing a people who um, aren't feeling very victorious. He's addressing a people who don't see God as very victorious because they haven't experienced God's mighty hand at work for themselves. They see that their homeland is lost. They see that their temple is gone, which was the dwelling place for God. So they have all these questions. So what do we make of this? God is reminding Israel um, that there's hope and that they can be confident in who he is um, because who they place their trust in is the victorious, the almighty, and the triumphant God, the maker of heaven and earth who can overcome even the greatest challenges because there is no match for God. This this scripture hit home for me um, this week as I was preparing because I think a lot of us might be in this boat. A lot of us at some point or another have gotten on our knees and said, God, where are you? God, I don't see you at work. I, I, I know you've been here before, but where are you now? You may even be feeling weary. Maybe this is where you're at today. Um, but again, the message of hope that God gave back then is a message for hope today because God is unchanging. God is the same God that he was then. He's the same God that he is today and he will be tomorrow. This is the rest of the continued response that he gave to Israel. Um, this is 18 verse, verses 18 to 21. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me. The jackals and owls too for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. I have made Israel for myself, and they will someday honor me before the whole world. So God just got done claiming victory for his miraculous actions in past history, and then he says, go ahead and forget all of that, what I just said. And this is interesting to me because I'm almost always somebody who says that we should never forget And not only should we not forget, but we should testify and we should continue to witness to the things that God has done in the past because it continues to strengthen our faith for now and in the future. So hearing this was a little shocking. Um, So what gives? God, did he just contradict himself after saying all these things that he's done to say, well, don't worry about it? And I I don't think that that's what God is saying. I don't think that God is saying to just erase the knowledge of God and erase the history um, and erase things that happened in the past. 
Instead, I read that we need to remember who we serve first and foremost, and that is what she remember, what she, we should remember, and not the specific events. Because if we hang on to the specific events of what happened and we hold that on a pedestal, then we're, we're taking essentially the one who gave us the blessings out of the equation. If we focus only on what's happened, we run the risk of separating who caused these events from happening from the event themselves. Throughout the Old Testament, um, we read time and time again uh, that God claims um, of bringing his people out of Egypt because it is a marker of his might. Israel's very identity was wrapped around the exodus from Egypt, so much so that it was easier to place the event of the exodus on a pedestal and forget that it was God that made that happen. And so they kept looking back into history at the exodus rather than looking back at history at God and what he's done. When we separate the blessing from the giver of the blessing, um, we have nothing to hold on to when times get tough, except to, to look back and hope maybe something similar will happen to that again because that's what I'm expecting and that's what I want. They expected God to deliver them the way that he had in the past, but it hadn't happened yet. They expected God to, to come to their aid in a way that the powerful Babylonian army would fall, the way that the Egyptian army fell, and it hasn't happened yet. They began complaining against God because he didn't meet their expectations of how they thought he ought to be God. So God's response to the people says, forget the past. Forget what you think that I should be doing because nothing or things can top that. You may think that nothing can top what I've done, but you just wait because I'm doing something and I'm doing something new. Don't you see it? It's happening already. We're being challenged here to be honest with ourselves, um, to check ourselves, and to take a good look at the expectations we have about God. Having expectations isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when our expectations are built upon the way that we want him to act or the way that we think he should act, we're building our expectations on the wrong thing. And we're putting God in a box and we're limiting God. When he doesn't act as quickly as we would like or if he doesn't act the way that we think he should, then we're going to be disappointed. And we're going to face those disappointments and sometimes even resentment can seep in because we think that he should be one way. But God, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his ways are higher than our ways. And so if we think that we know what's best, um, I'm, I'm glad that we don't. I'm glad that God is God. I'm glad that he's the almighty and he knows. Because time and time again, he shows up and things much greater happen than I would have ever, I would have ever thought. We can confidently expect God to be faithful and to show up in our worst times. We want to put our expectations on who God is and his, and his character rather than what we think he should do. We can be confident that he is going to um, love us, that he's going to extend grace to us even when we're undeserving. Um, we may not see how it's working yet, but we can be confident that God is working. We can find comfort knowing that he is a way maker, that he makes paths through the wilderness and brings hope when it looks like there is none. So that way when we find our times where we're on our knees and we're crying out to God and that's the only thing we can do is say, God, where are you? We won't falter because we have placed our trust in an unchanging God who doesn't break his promises and whose word is truth. Like that song, yes and amen, his promises are yes and amen. Even when we renew our expectations um, to be rooted in the character of God and, and who he is, um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to face hard times. We're still going to face hard times. We're still going to wonder at times why we are experiencing suffering the way that we are. We'll still deal with seasons of being in the wilderness, in the desert. But we can be confident when we face those times because there's hope in a God that is our refuge and our strength. We can be patient in affliction because we know that God has plans for us. Because we are his beloved, he will not leave us. Even though we can't see what's happening, we can rest in the presence of the Lord, which is something we can see all around us. If we take that time to just pause and be, we can see that the presence of God is with us and that we are not alone. 
No one or nothing can, can give us rest like he can. So going back to, the, to Israel, when they were saying, should I, should I pick these gods that are futile, or should I, should I stay with God who's hope? Um, you can try it out for yourself. Some of you may have already done that, where you've walked away from God and said, I'm going to go try a different path, and it never works out. It's never going to fulfill you. It's never going to do anything because those are false gods. They're not anybody who's going to be there to help you out. They don't love you, but God loves you, and God gives you grace, and God gives you um, truth in what he says he means. We're in the season of Lent currently. Um, Lent is 40 days leading up to Easter, um, and it's in this time that we pray and we fast and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us out of love. We remember that he's victorious, that he did not stay dead, that he is alive, and that he is alive today. Um, and we also can remember in this season that God will, Jesus will come again. The prophets uh, were pretty remarkable in the Old Testament because the prophets had had prophecies, and they were sharing these messages of hope with these people, and God gave to these people fulfillment of those promises in that moment. Here in this situation, um, God did raise up a leader to get them out of exile. Um, it was the Persian Empire that he raised up, so it was kind of a little unconventional. But it was the king who overtook the Babylonian Empire, King Cyrus, that allowed the people of Israel to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. And so they experienced God showing up in a very real way right in that moment. But the cool thing about the prophets and the cool thing about God is that he's not limited to just one thing. Um, that when we look at the lens of Jesus and we look backwards, we can see how Jesus has fulfilled these promises even more. Um, it's pretty spectacular that God can speak and God can foretell and prophesy things that happened years ago. But we can see that Jesus is the ultimate, um, the ultimate fulfillment. I can't help but think about the week um, before Jesus was arrested and crucified. Um, no doubt God's people were eagerly awaiting the time when the Messiah would come. They greeted him as he entered Jerusalem. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 11, verses uh, 9 and 10. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the, king, the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in his highest heaven. But what happened was that the people were thrilled to see God because they had expectations of who God was going to be. They had expectations of what he was going to look like. And um, the, the atmosphere changed a bit later in the week, um, as you guys know. Um, they got really excited, but, but Jesus turned out differently from what they hoped. And so this is what it says in uh, just a couple verses later, a couple days later, in Mark chapter 15, verses 12, and four, 12 to 14. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Jesus didn't fit the expectation of the Jews. They were expecting a militant leader who was going to come and bring about a kingdom like no kingdom has ever seen that they've seen before. They were going to come and, and show the Roman Empire who was boss. Um, but they couldn't see that God was at work. And he was, he was working in a way that he was doing something new. He wasn't going to fulfill their expectations because their expectations were built upon the wrong things. Instead, Jesus came and he did something that didn't compare to anything that's been done in the past. This past week, um, I was reminded of, of a friend from college who had experienced some, or in, is still experiencing quite a bit of suffering. Um, we were ministry leaders together. Um, so freshman year, we, we joined an outreach ministry together. And then sophomore year, um, we, we started leading this ministry. And she started to experience um, some concerning health, health conditions. And those small concerning things turned out to be really, really major things. And I remember sophomore year, she got to the point where she was having fainting episodes multiple times a day. Um, she was wearing a protective helmet and was in a wheelchair. This girl that was so full of life 
this girl who was telling me that she was going to be a pre-med major and she was going to go to med school and she was going to be a medical missionary for the Lord. And here she was looking weak. She was in class with me, I remember, and I remember she had books in her hand and they fell to the ground and she was laying there for a minute and nobody knew what to do because she had passed out. Um, this girl was the real deal. Um, I remember before she got sick thinking, oh man, I can't wait to see what God does in her life. I have huge expectations for her. She had huge ex expectations for herself. She was going to do these things. She was going to work for the Lord in a way that many of us can't say we could do, doing medical missions. Twelve and a half years since she started um, getting sick, she's still sick. She now has answers. Um, she has a couple of incurable um, conditions, and she still very much uses a wheelchair much of the time. Um, I remember at the time she wasn't even able to walk from one side of her dorm room to the other because it was too much, too much energy, and she would pass out. Um, but she is the first person who would shout from the mountaintop and say, God is faithful, that God is good, and that he is with her even in the midst of everything that has gone wrong. She had to change her expectations from what she thought her life was going to look like to put her expectations in who she lived her life for. And so here she is, 12 and a half years later, and her and her husband are doing some amazing things for the Lord. Just looks pretty different than what she thought originally. Her expectations now is that she's going to follow the Lord every day of her life, and whatever, whatever journey that takes her on is where she's going to be, and she's going to be content and happy in that. The Bible verse that she clung to throughout this season um, of suffering, and she still very much does today, um, is from Romans 12, um, chapter, or verse 12 as well. It says, Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. I urge you to, to think about that today as you leave here. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. We can be confident in our hope because of who we put our hope in and who we put our trust in. We can be patient in trouble because we know that God is doing something new and that God is at work and he's working. And we can keep on praying to live in the presence of the Lord in any season that we're in, whether we are in a season of contentment or we are in a season of suffering. This morning, um, we are going to be um, going to the Lord's table in communion. Um, Pastor Paul and Alyssa have some elements, so if you don't have them, if you forgot them this morning, um, if you just raise your hand and they can walk around and, and get those for you. Um, we come to a table that God meets us where we're at. Um, I love that idea. When I think of communion, um, my first thought is we go and we receive communion, but really God comes to us. God says, if, I, if you are earnestly seeking after me, then I am here and my arms are open wide to you. We, we practice open communion here, and so that means that you don't need to be baptized a member of our church. You don't need to be um, having any boxes checked, other than what we're saying is that you're earnestly seeking after the Lord, um, and that's, that's the only requirement. Um, communi uh, communion is a time where we can look back and see what God has done. We can look back and see what, he, what Jesus did on the cross for us out of love, the grace that he has given us um, to see his almighty power and how he conquered death and how he's no longer dead in the grave. But communion is also an invitation to look ahead to the future, to look ahead to when Jesus will continue to be victorious because the message of hope is that God is doing something new and he's doing it right now. Can you see it? God is going to bring about a time where there's going to be no more suffering. Jesus is going to come back and we're not going to experience the, the suffering and the times of feeling the weight on our shoulders the way that we do. There will be no more tears, no more sadness. We can look ahead and know that we serve an almighty God. We know that Jesus is moving and can move in ways that are far greater than any ways that we could ever expect um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, um, and I'm going to give some time. Uh, let's, let's take some time first to just really think about our expectations and think about where you're at and, and where you feel God is in your life right now. 
Um, Because I guarantee you, if you reach out towards God, he's going to reach back out towards you. So we're going to take a couple moments, and then I'll pray for us before we partake. God, we thank you that you are an almighty God, that you are triumphant. We thank you that you're God and we're not. God, sometimes we need to remember that. We need to remember that where we put our trust and our hope, it's nothing if it's not in you. God, we thank you for uh, being with us and meeting us in the place that we are. We don't need to be in seasons of contentment. We don't need to be in seasons where everything is is fine and dandy, although we, we thank you and praise you for those times when we are. But God, when we find ourselves in the midst of suffering, God, we know that you're with us and we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are a good God. God, we thank you that you are victorious. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't look like that around. We look around and in the disciples, they looked around as they're watching Jesus get arrested and the people yelling crucify him they probably didn't feel particularly victorious in that moment but God you were doing something you were doing something new and you're at work and so God we just pray that we can rest in your presence and see that you are all around us that you are with us in in every moment in good times and in bad times because we're your beloved God, we pray that as we come to communion today, um, we just pray that these elements, the, the bread and the juice, become for us today your body and blood through, through the pouring out of your Holy Spirit. God, we, we are reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took these elements, and it was a, a way to let them know what you were doing. It was a way that we could eventually look back But God, we know that in communion we can look at the future and look at the the promises that you have for us that Jesus will come again. And God, we are awaiting that day. But until then, God, we're going to have our confident hope in who you are. We're going to be patient in our troubles. And God, we're going to be praying. God, we thank you for, for showing up, for being faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do so in remembrance of him. Likewise, he took the cup and told his disciples, this is the blood of the new, or the, the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink and do so in remembrance of me. God, we thank you that you're with us in the midst of of the mess, that you're with us in the midst of the high times. God, we we pray that we can um, leave here today knowing that we can be confident and place our hope and our trust fully on you. We don't need to feel the weight of the world on our shoulders when we are experiencing fear and worry, when we're experiencing loss. God, we pray that you bring comfort. God, we pray that we can come and rest, be in your peace, the peace that only you can give that transcends all knowledge and understanding. God, we pray that you be with 
each person here today. God, we pray that they will leave here knowing that they have been in your presence and that your presence isn't just dwelling here at this church. Your presence goes with them and your presence goes before them. God, thank you for meeting us where we're at. Thank you for proving again and again and again to us who you are, how you are almighty, how you are more powerful than anything. God, thank you for loving us. In the midst of your might, (laughs) you love us more than what we deserve. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we just pray that um, wherever we're at today, we will know that you're with us, that you're doing something new. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me? I'm going to pray this over you. I pray that you are able to rejoice in our confident hope because of who we worship. I pray that you're able to be patient in our troubles because of who we worship. And I pray that you keep on praying, who is there with you, who can hear you. He's not some some God who is, you know, off there, but he is hearing every single thing you say, and he is watching you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.